I'm going to start the afternoon session now. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome um, our guest speakers for the second half of the day. Um, they're from Japan. On my right, I have Dr. Takashi Aoki. And he's going to give the first part of their joint presentation. And he will be followed um, by his colleague, Professor Yang, who has come from China. And I will tell you a little bit about each of them just, um, as they're about to give their talks. Professor Takashi Aoki is from Tokyo University and he went there initially to pursue um, an academic career in Islamic studies. But he tells me that at some point in his pursuit of research, he came across an Iranian mystic and from that point he became interested in Zoroastrian matters and Zoroastrian ideas. And that has taken him into his now main interest, which is Zoroastrianism. So it is my great pleasure to welcome him today. He's taken the trouble to come from Kyoto University. It has not been easy to arrange the visit of himself and his colleague. A lot of things were still uh, up in the air until very recently. And we, we, we lived in hope that he would come. And here he is. So I'm very pleased to welcome him. He has come with his student, who's also an avid and interested researcher in Zoroastrian matters. And so I'm looking forward immensely, as I'm sure you are, to hearing what Dr. Takashi Aoki is going to tell us today. I believe his main interest has been in Sasanian Zoroastrianism, but he's also let me know that there is a living community of Zoroastrians in Japan, and maybe he will give us some insight into that as well. So thank you very much, Dr. Aoki, for my to Today's title of our presentation is The Sunrise Zoroastrianism and Pansy Zoroastrianism in the Far East. The first part, The Sunrise Zoroastrianism, is covered by me, and the latter part, Pansy Zoroastrianism in the Far East, is covered by Professor Yang. And then, the first chapter, uh, from a point of view, from the Far Eastern Sarah's view, there is uh, many types of Zoroastrianism in the de development of this religion. For example, A, the Spanish personal Zoroastrianism, B, Gothic group Zoroastrianism, C, New Abyssinian Zoroastrianism, B, Magic Zoroastrianism, E, Malabrathmi, Indian Zoroastrianism, F. Armenian Zoroastrianism, B. Support Parthian Zoroastrianism, H. Persian Zoroastrianism, I. Sogutian Zoroastrianism, and J. Sinaite Zoroastrianism, and so on. This time, we would like to pick up among those variants of Zoroastrianism, the Sinaite Zoroastrianism, and policy for Eastern Zoroastrian meeting in Shanghai. Generally speaking, Zoroastrianism is the religion of Aryan people, but there is one exception. From 9th century to the 14th century, this religion was introduced from Iranian Plato and Central Asia to the mainland of China, and there it was strictly signalized and believed by Chinese one, some of Chinese people. This is a very interesting phenomenon, phenomenon in the history of Zoroastrianism all over the world. So we select the signalized Zoroastrianism as our tema today. Um, chapter 2, The Timeline of Zoroastrian, Section 1. Chinese historical documents, namely, New Pan Book or the Story on Sasanian Royal Family in China. The Sasanian last emperor, Yazadji III, after defeated at Mehaband in 600 and 42, 
was murdered at the Mer in 651. But according to Chinese documents, his second son, Pero, or in Chinese or and Japanese pronunciation, Piru, safely fled to Chang'e, namely the great capital of the Tang Dynasty Chinese Empire. That may be the largest megalopolis all over the world at that time. The Tang Dynasty third emperor, Cao Song, gave Pero a support army by which Pero and his boy, Narse, once recovered Shitsuryong. But unfortunately, this town is supposed in Eastern Iran or Central Asia, but its real type is unfortunately unknown. Some Japanese scholars supposed it was the rank, the famous Shahrestane or Stane Sistan, but there is no real argument to support it. And uh, uh, once recovered this unknown town in 661 for a very short time. But after Muslim army's counterattack, led by a uh, famous Kutaiba ibn Muslim, Peru and Narse and Chinese army were pushed to return to Chang'an. Then Peru died in 707 at the famous Persian temple with Chinese Emperor Cao Cao Khan kindly built for Zoroastrian in 677. Narse, the grandson of Yazadkin III and the legitimate Sasanian Emperor now, didn't give up his Persian Empire and Zoroastrian. He invaded again to Tohalistan and maybe Central Asia, uh, more exactly, northern part of Afghanistan and southern part of today Uzbekistan, with Chinese army to reconstruct the Sasanian dynasty. And this time, he miraculously succeeded to maintain his control there for 20 years. But finally, Muslim army drove him out from Central Asia, and Narse, while returning to Chang'an, died somewhere in Central Asia. Please see the map, map of the first map on the page of four. The Sasanian family was fled into China and counterattacked to the Iranian break, and again fled into China, then counterattacked to Iran, and finally fled to China. So they, uh, they made pistol movement on three times. But with Sasanian exiled aristocrats, however, for almost one century long, Sasanian Persian culture and Soviet merchant culture continued to flourish in the Far East. The last Sasanian family, whom Chinese record referred to, is Hosro. He lived at least in 728 in China. Then please see the Sasanian royal family in China. Yadavikit the third was died at Mel, and his second son Pero was died at Chang'an, and his boy Narse maybe died at Tohalistan and Hosro. I, I don't know who is his parent or who is his brother, but he died after 728 maybe China. Then, second part. Persian and Soviet Zoroastrian culture in China. The Sasanian exiled aristocrats and Soviet merchants brought with them two types of Zoroastrianism, namely Persian Zoroastrianism and Soviet Zoroastrianism into China. 
Chinese people at that time unable to recognize separately both types of Zoroastrianism and other religions, namely Manichaeism and Nestorianism, favored for their uh, exoteric characters. Then, Chinese famous poets refer to their Zoroastrian motifs so usually in the time period. For example, I picked up three ancient Chinese poems. Uh, those poems were taught for Japanese high school students, but it is much better to pronounce it in Chinese rather than Japanese. So please, Professor Yan, to read those Chinese poems roughly in modern Chinese pronunciation. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not good at uh, reciting the poem, but I will try to do my best. Uh, the first poem, Shao Nian Xing, Zhe Shi Li Bai. Wu Ling Nian Shao Jing Yi Su. An Ying An Bai Ma Du Chun Feng. Luo Hua Ta Jing Yu He Chu. Xiao Lu Hu Ji Jiu Si Zhong. I will read it in Japanese pronunciation. Uh, number one. Shonenko, Lihaku, Goryo no Nensho, Kim Mikko Nitsuki, Gingan Hakubari, Shunku Watari, Rakka Kumu Tokoro, Izreni Asobuka Wasirazu, Warate Hai Nuko, Shushino. Okay, the second, second one. Futa Meijo, Ye Guang Bei, Yu Yin Pipa, Ma Shang Cui, Zui Wo Sha Chang Jun Wo Xiao, Gu Lai Zhen Zhan Ji Ren Hui. And I read it in Japanese pronunciation. Liu Xiu Xi, Wu Kan, Budo no Bishu, Yako no Hai, Yo Pei Sa Jiao Ni Fuzi Kimi Wara No Dei, Ni Wa Ba Jiao Ni Mo Yo, Kora Ni Sei Sen, Iku Hito Ka Kai. Okay, the third point. Hu ren chui di rong lou jian, lou shang xiao tiao han yue jian, jie wen mei hua ji fan ji qu cong feng yi ye man guan shan. Excuse me, as Mrs. Sahim, you want to, want you, you to, want you, uh, to translate it into English. We want to have a meaning. So, Friends here may be able to help us. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this is written in, in um, older Chinese text, so it's not the kind that we come up to speak. I will give you a very brief sort of um, translation. The first one is um, youth, young people, sort of on a parade. Um, there are young people on a parade and they are riding on white horses with silver um, saddles and they are riding among the, the winds of spring and the horses are stepping on flower petals that have fallen from the trees and they are laughing and going into pubs with women who are coming from the west, who have come from the west. That's the first one. The second one, um, wine of grapes in illuminated glasses, and they had post people playing the Chinese pipa, which is a plucked instrument, and their songs are sort of egging them on. And when they are drunk, and lying about in battlefields, please do not laugh at them, because how many return from battlefields since ancient times? That's the second one. The third one, um, Western people, again, people who had come from the West, were playing their flutes in towers, you know, you know like towers of gates. They are higher up, they are on, 
on walls. So they are towers, but they are they are military towers. Fortress. Fortresses. Fortress. Watch towers. Yes, watch towers. Thank you. And the view of where they are looking out is somewhere in between the moon and the sea. And they are asking the plum blossoms how many times they can sing. And the answer came from the wind is that in one night they all blossom. So that's it. It's Adding to those ancient Chinese poems, there are some supposed ancient Japanese poems of the same motif. And adding to those literature, there is at least six Zoroastrian fire temples in the China megalopolis. Please see the map to China megalopolis of the time period and Persian fire temples there. According to Chinese official documents, in the time of Kaohsiung, in among the Chang'an megalopolis, there are total 21 Buddhist temples, and total 8 Taoist temples, and total 6 Zoroastrian fire temples. So, at the Tang Dynasty period, Persian Zoroastrianism and Soviet Zoroastrianism are so flourished in Chinese mainland. And section three. The popularity of Iranian culture in the seventh century China and mainly in Japan is the prerequisite for the Sinaite Zoroastrianism mentioned below. In the time period, there were Zoroastrian fire temples only in the colony of exiled Persian aristocrats and Soviet merchants in the northern China and in megalopolis China. Later, however, such religious sites also appeared in the mainland of China. For example, Kaifen. Kaifen is the capital of the Song Dynasty and the Zenchen, etc. Where no Persians and no Soviets were found. With this, the Zoroastrian fire temples were gradually assimilated into the Chinese religion in the Song period and became accepted Chinese belief. Then, Chinese, then Persian and Soviet Zoroastrianism in the Tang period were absorbed into Chinese religion in the Song period and the believer is changed from Persian and Soviet people to Chinese people. So at this time, Zoroastrian was not only Aryan people, Aryan people religion, but also become the Chinese, the son of Chinese people's religion. This Sinaite Zoroastrian has some characteristics as below. Number one. Sacrifice for some type of Zoroastrian god figure. This practice may be influenced by Sogudian Zoroastrianism. Because, as you know, that in the Sasanian dynasty, Tansan prohibits the animal sacrifice, no, no, prohibit the god figure and the democratic movement. So, this special character of Sinaite Zoroastrianism may be influenced by, not from uh, Persian Zoroastrianism, but by Soviet Zoroastrianism. And number two, in Yuan period, the common expression that Zoroastrian temple is on fire means uh, immoral love affair in Chinese literature. This reason is supposed that Zoroastrian next of kin marriage gives the heavy impression of immoral love in China. Then, my part is finished. The third part will be continued by Professor Yang.
Yeah, if it's going to be, go ahead. Now, um, we are going to hear Professor K.G. Yan's continuation of the information about what's been happening in China since the flight of Yazdegerd III and what's been happening since. Professor Yan, as you can see from the handout, works at Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences. Having begun his interest in generally the history of Western philosophy, and through his studies on the history of Western philosophy, he had come across Zoroastrianism. I have not heard Professor Yan in the past, but I have been told that he's a very excellent speaker, and he will inform us, I'm sure, about aspects of Zoroastrianism that will take over from Dr. Aoki. Um, we're looking forward very much to your presentation. I believe you're going to use PowerPoint to help us on our way, and I hope that the technology is working and you're able to use it happily. Are you ready for us now? Um, yeah, go ahead. And I will hand over to you then. Thank you very much, Professor Yan. Good afternoon, everybody. And it's my pleasure to be here to give, to share with you my uh, research about uh, about uh, the Parsi uh, community in Shanghai. And uh, first of all, please forgive uh, my uh, very bad English. So, but it's uh, one privilege for for me myself. I can have my. Uh, excuse uh, when you ask me some difficult uh, question. <laughs> oh, sorry. So. I, I need another, another, oh, sorry, another uh, file. Well, uh, my topic is the multitudes of the memory of the Parsi community in Shanghai uh, since uh, uh, 1843. Uh, actually, as, uh, as we know, there are a lot of Parsi pioneers before the Shanghai community and uh, since, nine, since 19th century. But uh, earlier than that, uh, there is some uh, historical uh, account uh, written by Abu Zaid, uh, our son of Siraz, in 10th century. In his account of China, he said that a re rebellion led by uh, Huang Chao uh, killed 120,000 Muslims, Jews, Christians, and uh, Parsis. This, is, uh, this uh, paragraph is uh, um, I get it from a 19th century English translation. And uh, some people argue that uh, the Parsi here used this uh, is not a denator to the, uh, to the Parsi from the west coast, coast of India. So probably this Parsi is the, is the Iranian uh, Zoroastrians. Yes, I, I agree that. And also uh, in, nine, in 1750, Six Giraji Jivanji regimony and his brother Manchurji start for China. They are from India, definitely. It was one of uh, merely one of similar adventurous sailings among his co-religionists then, and it probably never occurred to him that the regimonies could have become the Parsis who first settled in China. Uh, in contrast with their co-religionists who came over to China for their Chinese, for their China trade, the regimentist was the first Parsi who was permitted to stay in Canton and become rich through the trade to China. So I think it's an example of the diaspora of Parsi for the following centuries. Uh, of course, another well-known example is Sir Jamsetji Jijiboy, the business prince and uh, first Indian baronet in 19th century. 
And the third, we can find uh, and in the first half of 19th century, the Parsi merchant in Canton saw the uprising of the triangle trade between Great Britain, India, and China, especially the opium trade. The fourth, many Parsi families involved the China trade trade and have their firms and the traders in Canton, such as Kamars, Banerjee's, and the Wadiyas, and some, some other names I list here. So uh, one of scholar, uh, as one of scholar comment, the most valuable branch of the commerce of Bombay is the China trade. The fifth, we also got some, but those parties in Canton also suffered great from the opium war. Uh, uh, around the opium war, they are banned to sell the, the opium to the to Chinese people. And they have to they have to hand over all his opium to the government, and the government destroy it uh, in Canton. So the question is: <coughs> Does it withdraw? Does it withdraw from Canton or China forever? Uh, some scholars in China believe that uh, uh, with the with the decline of the China trade, the Parsi uh, also withdraw from China, especially uh, they withdraw from Canton, they went to Hong Kong and some other cities. But uh, I don't think uh, uh, this is the truth. I think uh, after, the four, after the Opium War, uh, the, with the opening of the treaty party, uh, including China, uh, Shanghai and the Ningbo and some other uh, cities in <coughs> South China, they, the Parsi continue to come to this uh, new land to seek their fortune. Uh, I say this ba is based on some resources. The first resource is a review of the origin and the growth of the Shanghai Parsi Cemetery, Trusty Funds. This is written by Shanghai Parsi Cemetery Trusty in 19, uh, 1935, printed by a Chinese, a Chinese printing. And in the introduction of this book, uh, the, um, the writer says that they collect a, a lot of uh, accounting books, a lot of uh, records of conference, uh, annual conference, and many other, thing, uh, many other materials in Gujarati. Because, because of the lack of uh, the, uh, the difficulty of the printing uh, technique in Shanghai, they, translated these materials in Gujarati into English and uh, write this book. And uh, this book is for private circle, of course. And the second uh, uh, resource is, uh, is an interview I did in 2000 with, uh, with a senior researcher in my institute. The, the title is uh, interview with Mr. Han Shao Shen, who was born in uh, 1911. Uh, he is a Chinese Catholic employee of a Parsi co company then, and then the Shanghai Parsi Cemetery. This is a, a, a published uh, interview. In, I, I did it in 1999. So the third, uh, the third material I, I do my research uh, is uh, interviews with Jiao Kuka, the more once worked as a full-time priest in Shanghai through 1931 to 1945. Uh, the, first, uh, the, fifth, the fourth book is uh, Indian in China. This is written by, uh, uh, by Madhavi Thampi. This is a very uh, brilliant book. But uh, unfortunately, she never, the author never talk about the Parsis in Shanghai. The, also, we have got uh, many other materials scattered in articles from many scholars uh, all over the world. Uh, and we, I and some, some of my colleagues collected these uh, um, this articles in, in a Chinese book. We translated these articles into Chinese. The, the work is foreigners in Shanghai or Shanghai, the Weibo Ren. It was published in 2006. So also we have got a lot of many other relative information books, interviews, archives, photos, uh, etc. So, 
So let, let me say something about the establishment of the Parsi Trusted Fund in, trusty funds in, in Shanghai. First, in uh, 1847, the, the judge, one of the first five parties who came to Shanghai, bought a land from Shanghai local government through a British merchant. And uh, by uh, 1854, they have already established eight firms in Shanghai. This figure is only next to the British firms, which is uh, uh, 27. And in 1860s, there were two Parsi companies in Shanghai trading cotton and opium. Uh, so as a Chinese scholar uh, comments, in early years of the opening of Shanghai, economical activity of Indian merchants should not be ignored. And uh, the Indian merchants, meaning here, is the Parsi, because as far as we know, uh, there, are another, there is no uh, other Indian ethnic group uh, living in Shanghai at that time. Uh, in 1854, the cemetery funds established symbolizing the formation of the Parsi diaspora community in Shanghai. Uh, Shanghai Parsi um, brought a piece of land measuring Tamil, partly for burial purpose, partly for religious use at uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese uh, money, uh, 603. Uh, they bought the land at the Fuzhou from Blue Lotus Tea House, which was bankrupt then. And I should say that the Fuzhou is at the center of the British concession at that time. Uh, other two pieces of land is, was owned successively by trusted firms. One is at the Hongqiao Road, and the other one is at the Xinzha Road. Uh, in, in, contract, in contrast with the Parsi in, Con, uh, in Canton, Parsi women began to sail for Shanghai to join their families rather than, uh, rather than the Parsi earlier than uh, 1842, when, they, when the Parsi traders in China usually come back to Bombay to join their family every two or three years. And also there is some um, um, things that, uh, uh, that the Parsi in Canton uh, have some relation with some, some Chinese uh, women, which, is not, uh, uh, which has not a good reputation. <laughs> so the trusted funds become a self-governance organization of the Parsi in Shanghai, treating both religious and secular affairs in, in Shanghai. This is a little bit thing as far as I see this, uh, which is quite different with the Parsi community in Canton. Uh, in 1872, the first trustee, trust deed has, have been, has been uh, registered at the British consulate, in which regulations on the nomination of the trustees the, ma the management of the properties and the uh, administration of the income thereof have been given. And the other, also, also this deed has been uh, updated in 1911. So uh, according to one of the clause, since, since I have forgot the PPT, uh, PPT text, I will, not, uh, I will not repeat it again, but uh, what I want to ask is that uh, there are uh, expression Iranian Zoroastrians in Shanghai. Does it mean that uh, actually there is do some uh, there do there is some Iranian Zoroastrian in Shanghai at that time? This is, is the only material mentioned mentioned this uh, which mentioned this uh, phenomena, and I have not uh, find uh, other materials so far about this fact. The, another factor is uh, the Parsi community in Shanghai stressed on the religious use of the enclosure, like uh, in other places. This is uh, this this is uh, very popular in the in the Parsi trustee fund all over the world. And uh, another thing is that is very interesting is that the complex is available exclusive for the Zoroastrians. And this uh, made, made it uh, uh, impossible for them to, to spread their religion uh, in, among Chinese people. 
uh, yeah, let, let me sh let me from let me uh, shift from the uh, the, um, the self self governance uh, group uh, to the worshiping place. Uh, a praying hall has established in eight, 18, 1866, which was the Prasi worshiping place that has ever had throughout all history in Far East. This is very important. Because uh, since we, we, as we know, we, we have got uh, more than um, thousand years of the Zoroastrianism in China. Uh, according to some materials, it, it's uh, very difficult to find some definite uh, material to demonstrate that uh, we have uh, the fire temple in China. Uh, this is one of the things we can see that uh, this is the one of the uh, a very very definite uh, demonstration of the establishing establishment of the fire temple in China, and uh, and uh, this praying hall is renovated in 1932 for uh, for 80 anniversaries of the trustee funds in 1934. Uh, also, many other Indians and the Parsis visited the Parsi trustee farms like uh, uh, Taigo and some other uh, famous, uh, maybe Zoroastrian, Zoroastrians all over the world, in, in different kind of part of the world, visit, uh, uh, visit Shanghai and visit the Parsi. And this is, the, this is the original site of the Parsi praying hall. Uh, I will tell you that now there is no more the the praying hall, but I will explain the, the reason later. And also, uh, I remember that, uh, uh, perhaps you remember that uh, I said, the Parsi uh, trust, trustee firm bought a land from uh, a tea house, a blue, blue lotus tea house. This, uh, this one is the blue tea house. Uh, original, uh, original site, still we have Still, we have uh, this uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, tea house, but uh, actually, at that time, the tea house is a very com uh, complicated, uh, uh, very uh, it, it, it is not a very um, a place with reputation. Uh, and lower class people gathering there have their tea, and also there are some pro um, some prostitutes. Sorry, the new chain. So uh, let's let's see the religious life of the Parsi in Shanghai. Uh, in early years, Parsi uh, ceremonies such as Najutis and Gesar Gesana are performed voluntarily by the members who have received the religious training in Ankara. And uh, in 19 in 1931, when Jakuka first uh, the first man Mobed came from uh, um, Madras in Bombay. He worked there as a full-time priest until 1945. And also the children from Sarastrians came to Shanghai to perform the Najutis from uh, inland China cities like uh, Beijing, Tianjin, Hankou, and uh, some other cities from Japan. This is uh, uh, John Kuka who was born in 1909. And uh, he, I, I should say uh, he is still alive Till last year, because uh, because I uh, last year I received the invitation from his wife and he himself to attend his 100 year anniversary in Mumbai. Uh, surely, uh, and also everyone know who is sitting be beside him. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, another one. Uh, so. From sorry, yes, yes. From from Jakuka, I know many things about the history um, uh, of the Parsi community here uh, and there in Shanghai, and I will I will tell you later a bit later, and uh, I would like to say something about the sh about the about the some 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 story about uh, in the in the eye of Parsis in, uh, living in Shanghai. Uh, this is perhaps we know. This is uh, a very famous photographer, Sam Tata, who was born in Shanghai. 
Uh, and this is a very brief uh, biograph of uh, Sam Tata. And uh, so let's go through it. Uh, so actually, uh, I j as I mentioned, uh, he met, uh, he met uh, uh, another very famous photographer from French whose name is Bresson in, 19, in 1948 in Mumbai, and they become friendly. And, uh, soon and also uh, Santa is uh, uh, influenced by uh, by by Bresson, and uh, their phot photograph is uh, uh, has a very uh, very specific uh, uh, corrective. That is this decisive movement. They just snap some very very impressive uh, scenes uh, to 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 describe uh, some some great events. So this is a, a photo photograph uh, a picture that uh, taken by uh, Bresson, and uh, it is uh, those people crowded for for buying in some gold at that time, because the uh, the money is not money any anymore there. So also let me see some more Tatar's decisive moments about Shanghai. And this is an uh, album uh, published in 1980s, uh, which is to taken by, uh, by Sam Tata. Uh, and uh, through this uh, photograph, we can, we can find what, uh, what, what the imagination of and what, what the Shanghai is in, in a Parsi eye or in a Parsi uh, mind. And this is uh, uh, Foreigners living in Shanghai withdraw if just before just before uh, 19, 1949. Uh, another picture is some people coming or coming or go out from Shanghai, and uh, in front of us are two uh, Republican soldiers, and the, on the behind uh, you can see two part, uh, policemen. And also, this is uh, this is another picture taken uh, taken by Sam Tata. Uh, this is a communist uh, communist party, and uh, uh, he is uh, he is on trial and will be executed. Uh, only only one not with one month uh, after the Shanghai after Shanghai is liberated by the uh, PLA. And also, you can find some some uh, Republican soldier uh, withdraw from Shanghai, and uh, the parade of the um, for celebrating the liberation of Shanghai, and some uh, some propagandas uh, uh, by the soldier. And also, you can find that uh, Tata not only um, paid his attention to some uh, great in, uh, events, also he also see some very something very that is very detailed in uh, in what happened in Shanghai. Uh, also, some some advertisement uh, like, and uh, at that time, still the foreigners. This is a uh, this is a, a screen. Uh, this is the scene of uh, uh, of the French club, and uh, you can see they have they just uh, the foreigners just enjoy their life. Even the Shanghai has been taken over by the Communist Party. Uh, yes, yes, we do. We do have some foreigners uh, uh, that that Catholic nuns leaving Shanghai at the time around around 1949. Yeah, let's uh, let's see another another Parsi and uh, what what he is thinking about uh, uh, image Shanghai. This is uh, this is another Parsi I uh, I interviewed in in nineteen uh, in two thousand year uh, when I was conduct my re research there. Uh, supported by Ford Foundation, and uh, he is a Parsi, uh, born in Shanghai in 1936, and his brother at that time is the president of the trust trustee fund of Hong Kong, and both uh, mm, these two boys was born in Shanghai. Uh, sorry, and uh, but uh, unfortunately I. Didn't get many uh, things from his uh, from this interview, and but only one thing he told me that uh, he just uh, remember a very dirty 
Chinese word. This is uh, only one thing remained in his mind. <laughs> yeah. That is true Rasi and the true Shanghainese because he, sp he can speak that word in, in Shanghainese, not only in Chinese. Uh, but still I, can, I got a lot of uh, many in, uh, interesting things. This is the certificate of his, uh, uh, his birth certificate. And uh, it indicated that uh, uh, through this uh, certificate we can imagine the average people there in Shanghai at that time. Uh, I mean, average Parsi. Uh, he, his mother gave uh, uh, his birth, uh, gave his birth in a very very uh, expensive uh, uh, hospital run by a Germany, run by a German that is Baolong Hospital. And uh, he and his family lived in Western part of Shanghai, which is uh, like, uh, maybe like uh, London is the west part, is a very expensive uh, area. So I think, um, I think um, the average Parsi living in Shanghai has uh, uh, lived a very higher life there. Uh, so, <clears throat> okay, okay let's, let's shift to the Parsi in the eye of a Chinese employee. Uh, Yes, this is based on my interview with uh, the employee of um, of the uh, of the trustee fund of Parsi in Shanghai. First of all, I would like to to cite some some Chinese term terminologies uh, when he used to describe Parsi. Uh, the Shanghai Parsi Cemetery True Trustee. He gave a very typical Chinese word uh, that is Bo Si Gong Shu. Uh, if you know, understand, uh, if you understand Chinese, may, probably you know uh, this is a very old, uh, very traditional translation. And uh, he he translate usually we translate Parsi uh, directly from the pronunciation into Chinese according to the pronunciation. But the, in his uh, in his uh, language, he give a very useful, a very correct translation, that is the minority of Persia. So I think his translation is proper. And also, also he has a, uh, the Parsi praying hall, he gave, gave us uh, another translation which is quite different uh, uh, with what we used in the, uh, in the scholastic circle. That is a baito li baito. That is uh, that is the uh, worshiping whore by the white turban person. Uh, he gave us a very gave us a very very typical uh, Shanghainese expression, and uh, he I should say he is a Catholic, and he also used the Catholic term to describe the Najut. Uh, and the first one. The first one. This is very, very kusti, very kusti. But uh, and Zosasan is not a, a popular uh, saying in, in pre at present uh, Chinese. It is a, a very old Shanghainese expression. So uh, when he first mentioned this word, I, I, I just get confused and I ask him to write it down so, so that I can understand what the Zosasan is. Also, uh, he is afraid. He is afraid of uh, mm, maybe he, he afraid that I ca cannot understand the, what, what the uh, the Kokuski is, what the Najuti is. He used the Catholic term, saying this is something like a first communion. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if it is right. And also, he gave us a, a very, very good translation of the, pres the name of President uh, Trustee Fund in Shanghai, Talati. Uh, he used a very, I think it's a good, very good Chinese expression, Tai Lan Tian. So uh, please, uh, please, uh, uh, please uh, permit me to, to recite recite a word, uh, several words uh, 
of, um, of the Parsi, Parsi's religious life as described by, by this Chinese person. Uh, I will translate it into English uh, a little bit. Uh, about their religious, I know very few, but because at that time I just work and I didn't do, uh, do any research regarding to his religion. According to his family, the, the wife, uh, his wife uh, every day prayed every day at uh, least two hours and also he recited the scripture. Uh, she used the Afrikaner uh, with, uh, with a larger up and also with, with a foot, just like our uh, uh, checklist. Tra but it's, uh, it is a little bit smaller than the checklist, and also it has a very big plate. They usually they burn the sand world and with the carbon, and also they use the frank, frank incense. When they recite the script, they, they put some uh, frank, lights, uh, frank incense on the, um, uh, on the Afrikaner. After, after the, when, they be, when she began to recite, she will keep silence and the, he will never say anything. Uh, if you have anything to ask her, uh, she, she, will, she just give you the gesture to, to express his uh, meaning. And according to, their, <coughs> according to their rule, when they are praying, nobody should interrupt them. Uh, once upon a time, my boss forget to get something from the family. He asked me to, to fetch it for him. I said, I said to the, say to his wife, uh, where the, this thing is in the in the home. He just uh, just uh, uh, keep keep his uh, mouth closed and never say anything. And and the maiden maiden said that uh, after, usually every. At, at seven or eight o'clock in the morning, the, his wife will recite the, the scripture. This is what the, what the Chinese image the, the religious life of the Parsi in, in Shanghai at that time. So, uh, so perhaps perhaps everyone uh, remembers the. Sam Tata's photograph taken in around 1949. I just wonder, I just wonder why he didn't take any pictures about the Parsi community there, about the Parsi community in Shanghai. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe. Maybe the Parsi community is not a not a very great event that which which has happened in that period, but still, we have another answer about that. The question is when did the Parsi withdraw from Shanghai? As as Professor John Hinos believes that in his uh, book written in published by Ashgate in two thousand, he says that. Uh, Parsi withdrew uh, from China, uh, like Shanghai and some other cities, uh, in in 1949 after the communists take over, take over China. But uh, according to my research, it, it, it is not uh, true. Uh, first, I would like to cite the testimony of uh, Zhao Kuka. Uh, this is the original uh, original words I. First, I translated into uh, Chinese. Uh, he says, in December 26, 1945, organized by British authority, I went back to Mumbai. When I left everything in Shanghai except one shirt in my body, uh, this is uh, this is because this is because a serious conflict conflict between Labour Party of Clement Attlee and the Republic of China. Because it was in 1945 when the Japanese-China war ended. The Republic of China 
take over almost all the land of China. And uh, firstly, they just want to take back Hong Kong. That is why China and the uh, uh, conflict with the British, uh, Greater Britain at that time. So, uh, actually, actually, five earlier than the liberation, Parsi with other British citizens withdraw, withdraw from most city of China. So, what happened afterwards? I mean, after 1949. Also, I can I can get some traces from the from interview with Han Shaosun. He said one thing: Talati, the president of Trusty Funds, did not return to Mumbai until 1952. He also said that uh, why he returned to Mumbai so late, because, because still there are some Parsis living in Shanghai. The number is fewer, even though the number is fewer than before. Uh, the other thing is, uh, that seems uh, very interesting is that uh, the lands in Hongqiao Road and Xinza Road owned by the Parsi community has have been sold to the borrow of Shanghai municipal government, except the one at the Fuzhou Road, where the trusty funds and the praying hall located. Still, we have got the three employees by by the trusty funds to take charge of the buildings and collect the rentals for the parcels and the money. As was uh, handed to India Consulate General at Shanghai till 1966. And uh, in 1966, the Red Guard took over the praying hall, burned down the complex and the library and the bookshelves, and destroyed the cemetery. Uh, but uh, one year, only one year later, only one year later, the complex has been taken back by the local government and the revolutionary committee. Uh, it was then used by a community factory for those young employed people who has not been sent to the villi villages uh, for various reasons. And uh, this is the end of the history. In, 19, in 1992, the empty buildings are demolished for infrastructure construction. So let's uh, go to some, uh, some conclu conclusions. The first one is that the Parsi community in Shanghai is a metaphor of the energies and the ambitions of the Parsi as an ethnic group of, uh, in the world. The second thing is that the Parsi in Shanghai kept a religious life with them from, from their homeland and also their cultural tradition. The third point is the uh, Parsi praying hall in Shanghai has been the only uh, Zoroastrian temple that can be confirmed in the thousand years of Zoroastrianism in China. Last but not least, the self-governance of the Parsi community may also throw some light on the development of the expatriate groups here in Shanghai in the 20th century, which are growing rapidly at, at the moment. Thank you very much. Um, the nearest mic, I think it's the nearest question is here. Oh. Oh. Uh, uh, Professor Yan, uh, we spoke a little earlier about two Parsi ladies who uh, tried to uh, just uh, go over and upset by speaking in Chinese in front of their Parsi husband. I now recognize the name, it is in fact Talati. The other one I wish to ask is, what area of land does a Mao cover? I forgot to interpret. Mao as in Mao Zedong. What area? How many square feet? How many, what, what, what? Dimension. Dimensions of a Mao. How big is a Mao? Acre. Chengdu, the Liao Yu, the Dongdu, 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 the
It's 10 acres. 10 acres. Whether it's a metric acre or a Hector, imperial acre. Yeah, it's still large. Yes, it's 10 acres. Thanks very much. Um, as I have the mic, I'm going to ask you a question um, about the present day community in uh, Tokyo, uh, Kobe. I have heard there is a Parsi, uh, maybe a few people, maybe one person, and also I've heard of a lady, an 80 year old lady called Hiro Kunushizawa. Do you know anything about this lady? And can you tell us something about the Kobe community in Japan? Sorry, I don't have any information about Hiroku Nishigawa, but it's a typical, <coughs> typical Japanese name. Uh, if she uh, um, I've been asked by an Iranian friend to mention this lady Hiroku Nishigawa because we have heard in Iran about her having an interest in Zoroastrianism, if not herself being a Zoroastrian. So you know nothing about her. I will make inquiries. But can you tell us something about the Kobe Zoroastrians? Are there Zoroastrians in Kobe, Dr. Ayoki? Uh, I have information about Shanghai community. I can say something about the Kobe, the famous Japanese port city, Kobe art community. Since uh, 19th century, there is a uh, Small community, small party community came from Bombay and uh, they continued to live in Kobe for three or four generations. And still in Kobe, there are 10 or 20 families of party. Uh, some of them, uh, one of them, one of the party ladies, party young ladies, uh, graduate the Japanese college and she is now working as a uh, journalist. Her main language is Japanese and she is not famous in the current community in Bombay and Iran but her articles are very popular in Japanese women and we have some Another party doctor or party lawyer in Kobe. But uh, I, I believe in this room, uh, in this room, there uh, someone uh, who, has, who has much information about Kobe party community or Yokohama party community or Tokyo party community. So I would like to ask the someone to give me more information about Japanese party community. Is there any who know about the party community in Japan? The question is, does anybody else know anything about the Japanese Parsi community? I suspect not, which is why it's very exciting to hear my, from you. But maybe my, my uncle, Paul Monsieur Amrolia, was in Japan. But where? I don't know anything about it. Any other questions, please? One over there. You can sit in the No, I wanted to ask one question. Uh, what does Tanu, Urwan, these are the names manufactured by Japanese car, mean? Mazda. Mazda. Yes. What do they mean in Japanese? In Japanese. Uh, Mazda, in, uh, exactly speaking, not Mazda, but its Japanese pronunciation is Matsunda. And this is a popular family name among Japanese people. The founder of the uh, car maker Matsuda is named Matsuda. But Matsuda uh, is not convenient for foreign people to pronounce. So he uh, changed the middle uh, term from Z to Z. 
So that company is called not Matsuda, but Mazda. What about Uluan and Tanu? Han Han. Tanu and Uluan. Uluan. Uluan, yes. Uluan, uh, Uluan. As far as I know, Uluan is the ancient Avestan yes. world. Yes. But it is a, uh, it's a, uh, uh, make, a make of a car. So what does it mean? It's a Japanese car. <laughs> I don't know that Japanese car is called Uruma. Okay, any other questions please? I saw Lucy's hand is up there, so could you get it to Lucy please? And then afterwards we'll try and get one out of the map. It was a very uh, interesting uh, um, description of the Parsis in uh, Shanghai, but is it possible to give some idea of the total numbers that they were there? Uh, to be able to call a community? Uh, as far as I know, I, uh, I just can give the, the, the number when the Parsi, the Parsi community uh, prospered in, in 1930s. It is uh, totally uh, two, uh, 200 people there in Shanghai. It's, but uh, maybe, maybe this, figure, this figure is one of the largest uh, trustee farm. Uh, other than the Mumbai one in the world. I mean, the diaspora uh, group, maybe the last, uh, largest one in, 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 in the world. Are there any Zoroastrian Parsis in China today? Uh, y yes, or many individuals. Individuals. Yeah, they, uh, as far as I know, uh, there, there is no uh, prominent uh, uh, Parsi family in Shanghai, but uh, we have got uh, six families of Parsi in Beijing, and some of them are journalists working for some United uh, newspapers, uh, like Boston, Boston, Boston Globe. Yeah, Boston Globe. There's a restaurant there, Parsi restaurant. Oh, yes. Yeah. Where? In, in Beijing. Shanghai. I have in Shanghai. No, I, I know there are a lot of Chinese restaurants in Mumbai run by Parsis. Persian There is a Persian restaurant in Shanghai called Persian Princess. It was a nightclub also. Yeah. I've yes. been there last year. Yes, there is there is some Persian restaurant, but but is it is it a Russian restaurant? I'm, I'm, I'm no, not I, sure. I don't know about I'm not sure. It is a Persian princess oh. restaurant. It's a mall, a very nice area. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah. Nice. Also, also we do have some uh, Indian restaurants run by some Indians from Mumbai. But uh, uh, as far as we there is not a Parsi restaurant. So, um, I have actually a question for each of you. First, maybe Dr. Aoki. Um, you, you mentioned in your text about the sinolized Zoroastrianism, um, which has characteristics such as um, sacrifice for some type of Zoroastrian god's figure. I would be interested in, in what sort of god's figure, um, like how, how is it shaped, or how can I imagine that? And, and, and the question to Mr. Um, Dr. Young would be, if you have uh, any, any expertise in, in the field of manichaeism, like the followers of money, because I've, I've read in, in some several sources about um, Ms. Mani had a, a famous holy book where he used a lot of colors and drawings in order to, um, uh, to support his, his, his or makes it better understandable what he was teaching, his teaching is the church. And there are only a very few books have survived until today. And one of these books are apparently in, the, in China, in the Museum of China. I would like to know if you know anything about it, in which museum that would be uh, visible, that, that book. Uh, thank you. Thank you for a question. Uh, thank you for a question. But uh, I have no idea about the question which animal the Chinese Zoroastrians sacrificed for the God's But after returning to Tokyo, 
I will read just ancient Chinese document more thoroughly. So I would like to send you email about your question. Is it okay? Sure. Uh, please give me your email after. Thank you for your question. My, my brief answer is uh, that it is almost not available uh, for, for the mechanical sculpture uh, in, in Chinese uh, language uh, because they are all published. They are all published. So uh, it is not uh, necessary for you to get it from uh, any specific uh, uh, museum. You can find some, some books if you are interested in it. Uh, for for your for your first question, uh, the mecha mechanism is uh, is a little bit uh, popular in uh, in Song dynasties uh, and some other dynasties. But uh, it's very interesting that the mechanism is, uh, did not survive. But it uh, shifted in another form. Uh, what, what I would like to say: the popular uh, religion in China in China. Yeah, excuse me, with that request, I've got another question, Professor. Um, but what I would like to ask, would that be the white lotus, then? The white lotus? White lotus. Would it be the manichaeism going, developing into the white lotus in China? White lotus. Who do you want to answer the question? Well, I'm sorry. I um, Professor Ayoki, would, was Songdian Zionerosterism influential um, or did it ever arrive in Nara, Nara dynasty, Nara Jedi? Um, did it influence Nara dynasty? Yeah. That's your question. No, no. Did Zionerosterism influence Nara Jedi dynasty? Nara Jedi. Right. What, what, what is the Narajidae? I'm um, sorry. Uh, uh, I thought you mean Narajidae, by, by the word Narajidae, you mean the Japanese dynasty? Yes. Ah, I was wondering whether. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, uh, Narajidae means the Japanese ancient dynasty from the 7th century to the 10th century. Is it okay? So. Oh, thank you for the question. But uh, the Song Dynasty is from 960 to uh, 1279. So Song Dynasty Sinorized Zoroastrian has no influence to Japanese Nara Dynasty. But the uh, Tang Dynasty's Sogudian Zoroastrianism may have much influence of Nara Dynasty in Japan. So please refer to Professor Gikyo Ito's uh, article written in Japanese. I have referred to it in bibliography. According to his opinion, uh, some, some of Persian exile aristocrats came to Japan in 700 and and yet, in the 8th century, and uh, asked Japanese emperor to lend the Japanese army to recover the uh, Persian Empire. But uh, his argument depends on the, his decipherment of ancient Japanese poem, and not definite conclusion. His conclusion is not definite. So this uh, argument is still open now. Thank you. Yeah, um, yes, I remember your question, so. Yeah. Actually, the white lotus sector is, uh, is uh, it's, uh, to some extent, it's a proper name for, for some relig uh, popular religion uh, that is a whole that, that opposed to the, to the government. So uh, I should say some of the, uh, some of the mm, set, some of them are influenced by some me mechanism, but uh, they, 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 they just uh, adopt some, some names, uh, so some elements, but not the, not the mechanism as a whole. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
documenting the existence of various ethnic people as well as religious people. Can we document through these senses, right, the presence of Zoroastrians in China, that's through, through the Tang dynasty? Either one. <laughs> As far as I know, that uh, uh, we only find some fragmentary historical rec records about Zoroastrianism. And also, you can find some official official records, but, uh, but not systematically. And, and is it your question? Yeah, I mean, are these? I thought these senses are all preserved. The census records. <laughs> Not available. Could I please ask Dr. Uh, Dr. Aoki about Shintoism, mm. specifically mm. the sun goddess, or the sun goddess case maybe, mm -hmm. Amaterasu. Yeah, yeah. Is there any connection with Pithraism? Mm. Thank you for your question. Um, if my understanding is correct, you, your question is about the relationship between ancient Russian and Japanese Hinduism? Indeed, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. yes of course, Japanese highest, Japanese Hinduism highest goal, Anaterasu, is a sun god, but it is a human god. So, and um, it was believed that from the um, from the sixth century, the Amatera is believed the highest god and the ancestor of Japanese emperor's family. But as far as I know, the first arrival of Zoroastrian into Japan is the seventh century. So there may be no direct connection or direct relationship between the uh, foundation of ancient Shintoism and arrival of Zoroastrian into Japan. Uh, this actually concerns Mithraism more than Zoroastrian. Ah, Mithraism. Mithraism, exactly. Because mm. I understand mm. that Amaterasu mm. retires into a cave, mm. is reborn from a rock. Mm. Now these are Mithraic yes, yes, yes. as well. Yes. Do you see any connection or does it just happen to be that way? I didn't have such an idea, but it is a very interesting opinion for Japanese people. Mm. Yes. You research. Yes. And your <coughs> question raised new research, the possibility of new research. Actually, Professor, you mentioned Gikyo Ito. Yeah. He had done research into this, you know. No. In Japan, yes. no one has so much interest in Mithraism. Yes, yeah. So we have almost no information about Mithraism, especially the ancient Japanese culture. So they, could, they couldn't count such possibility that Shinto is is influenced from Mithraism. Yeah. After returning to Japan, I will uh, talk about the, your opinion. And do the consonants mm. in the word Amaterasu, mm. M T R S, M -R is that coincidental or is it, uh, it means something else? Uh, what does it actually mean? Amaterasu, mm, yes. Yes, if pronunciation is, uh, if we pick up the console, M-T-S. 
it's like but to without the a ah yes uh, in according to Japanese grammar ama ama means the haven and terasu means uh, illumination so without the first a it won't become nothing so I uh, at this time I can't imagine that the, the name of Amaterasu itself was influenced by the ancient uh, Iranian god name Mitra. But of course it is one possibility. Only the coincidences are so many. Mm. It seems unwise to just drop one mm. and say no 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 it's pure coincidence. It mm. could be more I'm not saying it is, mm. but it could be more than that. Yeah. And so, thank you for your answer. Uh, can I ask, uh, please, Professor Yang? Yes, please. Professor Yang, uh, it's a rather delicate question as far as Chinese are concerned. Can you tell us, please, about Western China, the Tarim mummies? Yes. Yes. Uh, please, I don't wish to embarrass you, but. Uh, who are they? Who are, yeah. who are they? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so some eco ecologists, uh, eco ecologists believe those money is uh, as the uh, in the race is uh, the Indo-European. Uh -huh. yeah. Have they dated them? Yes, they have. Um, from they run from fourteen hundred BC right. through about eight or nine hundred BC. Okay. No, with the Victor says they took our That's it, I mean. and, and the other point, it's, it's not so much a question, it's just a point. During the Tang Dynasty, in western China, especially coming south now of the Gobi, <coughs> or the Tatli Makan is called, coming south in Dandan Oluk, they found this beautiful plaque, which is in the British Museum, and it's commonly called the Rustam. Bodhisattva. Do you know anything about it? Have you seen this plaque? It's a beautiful one, actually. It's a Sathanian warrior in brocade, very rich brocade. And he is holding, I think, is it four hands? He's holding four different items <laughs> in his hand. It's well worth uh, examining, just purely for possible connections with uh, the Sasanians coming east out of uh, Iran and the Chinese going west into the Tatli Makam. Because this comes from Dandan and look roughly 8th century. Uh, I'm sorry, I have... Uh, um, I didn't make such, such yeah. a kind of... And it might interest to Dr. Aoki to know that the same panel was sent to Japan, to Nara, for a special exhibition. I just thought I'd mention it. Anyway, so I hope it is. Are there any more questions towards the yeah. back? I know that you are here, Joel. Just to make sure that nobody's left up, we'll come to you next time. Okay, and before you start, we have to make our new paper here when all we do. Right, thank you. Yes. Sorry about that. So, uh, okay, Joel, go ahead. Professor Loeki, in Japanese, there is no L. La. It's not pronounced, it's not written, it's not. In, in Avastan language, there is no love. Do you know any reason why, I mean, uh, afterwards, a love is written as Ra, but, but that's, uh, that's an afterthought. What I'm saying is, is there any connection between Japanese and Avastan language not having love? No. I'm not English. What are the on religion? Yes. As, as he says, he's an expert on religion rather than linguistics. Sardin has an L. While, while the mic is being taken around, I'm going to take the liberty of a question. I'm going to ask Professor Yan if you can tell me. I have heard that the surname Liu, L-I-U, was used as an honorific for people who were descended from the Sasanian courts. Is there any um, truth in that? Is there any history on that? Could you make any comment on the surname Liu? 
I'm sorry, I didn't uh, uh, look up such kind of, but maybe the girl yeah, over there. Yeah. It's Lee. 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 Question, and I think it's an interesting answer, maybe. Yeah, they didn't adopt Liu as their um, uh, surname. They, they adopted uh, Li, I, I, as their surname. Who, is, who adopted Li? And the Sasanian, um, the, the, the Persian peoples in Tang Dynasty. And Still to be found in the Chinese people? Yes, you can, you can find it from some epigraphs excavated from Xi'an. And today, are the people probably still have some Iranian descendants? No, today it's so difficult to, to find the traces. Some mm, scholars joked at me, I'm from Central Asia because my surname is B. In Sabdiana, uh, Sub there are some um, small kingdoms. Um, some people from Kaikant, they adopted B and they are Chinese names, so they, why they joke at me, I'm from Central Asia. <laughs> so it, it's difficult to find the relationship. Right, so there was, but not today. Yes. I'm just going to pass the mic here. Uh, hi, yeah, I got, I got a question from one professor. Uh, for Professor Aoki, you had mentioned that there was evidence of various Zoroastrian fire temples in, I believe it was end of Tang Dynasty into the Song Dynasty in various parts. And I'm curious if we know this because of historical documentation or if it's also because of some archaeological investigations. And regardless of that, I'd be interested if you could tell us anything you know about any current archaeological investigations in China to do, you know, that are going on right now. And then, should I wait or have a question for Professor Yen as well? Okay. Thank you for your question. I hope in future there are uh, some Sahasa ruin or other Dagma ruin will be discovered in China Megalopolis and the Northern uh, Soviet and the Persian colony. But at this time, at present, we have no discovery of the Zoroastrian fire temple in the mainland of China. So, my my thing is okay? Yeah, my second question is for Professor Yen. Um, I know personally that of at least several Parsi families that have been going back to Shanghai over the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years in an attempt to get back some of their property that has to leave behind. Because I understand they all had to leave Shanghai in a hurry. I'm curious if you have had a chance to either um, meet or interview any of these Parsi families coming back or if you know um, if you know anything about that, this you know trying to uh, you know get back some of their land and possessions, um, you know right now in terms of Parsi families. Uh, first of all, I would like to know I would like to know uh, which kind of properties they want to get back. I personal or some personal, uh, oh. just personal. Okay. Uh, I heard about that event uh, when I was visit I uh, visit uh, visit Mumbai and I met come across some some Parsis there and they, they told me such things happened. Uh, but uh, I was also told that they they did not uh, succeeded in doing that. Uh, the problem is that uh, it is very difficult for both sides to to collect uh, enough enough information about that. And I do have some things, uh, case with with uh, some Chinese uh, withdraw from Shanghai, and they come back after maybe thirty years later. They get they did get back their properties, but uh, but 
uh, this is only because they have kept the complete materials or uh, uh, documents. I have one quick follow-up question for both scholars. If you could give us a sense of what other scholars in the world are doing similar research to yours and what kind of uh, subjects and issues those scholars may be covering, just to give us a sense of uh, you know, other people doing similar work as your own for both of you. In Japan, Zoroastrian uh, study is not so popular, but uh, I know four students whose main subject was Indian Islamic culture, but they can uh, read modern Persian and modern Gujarati. And now, uh, because of my push, they shift their interest from Islamic culture to Zoroastrian culture. So in future time, Japan, from Japan, there will uh, much Zoroastrian uh, scholar whose attention focused on the Parsi culture in Western India will come, um, will come. Uh, actually, in China, we've got the three groups of scholars uh, who are interested in, in Parsi or Zoroastrian studies. One group is from uh, 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 Zhongshan University, which is located in the south of China. And uh, they, they do a very good uh, philo philological studies. Uh, in, uh, they, there is a, a tradition like that. And uh, the second uh, group is from the northern China like uh, Beijing University and some, uh, some other institute of archaeology, uh, Academy of Social Sciences. Uh, those people uh, studied the Parsi or the Zoroastrianism based on their uh, discovery of the, uh, of the uh, archaeological dis di uh, discoveries. And the third group is uh, from, uh, from our institute. Uh, we, uh, we do re research uh, as, uh, as, uh, as a comparative uh, uh, Religion. Thank you. Are there any more questions that we have not taken yet? Well, that looks like we have one satisfied most people's curiosity. But um, if I may ask you, since you had a question, okay. um, to perhaps come up later on, um, I'm going to ask us to have a five minute comfort break and to round everything up with the final questions on the panel, basically, all the speakers that we've had today, plus an internal shut for the time we come back. And at the front, we then have the last few minutes for any general questions that anybody wants to direct to anybody because they've had time to think about things and they might have wanted to ask a question. Maybe more time will come later. Thank you. So, five minutes break, and then we'll see you very much. In which case, this is the last session, and um, obviously some people had to leave to catch trains and buses, but um, we didn't want to leave any of you without the opportunity to ask any final questions. So it's an open floor now. Please make it clear who you would like to address, and please ask your questions. Anybody who's got any burning last questions? Because if you haven't, then we can simply round up. But I see one question at the back there. Yes, thank you. Professor Insler, you said that we should try and encourage the younger population in our community to come forward and take up the mantle of learning about terrestrialism and uh, what it really means for the Gathas. How do you propose that we should go about doing this? Well, I had the honor to address Zoroastrian groups both in Bombay and here, and I often ask them, have you ever read the Gathas? 
right? in, even in the worst possible translation? And the answer always is no. And they always want to say, what does Zarathustra say about this? What does Zarathustra say about that? And I say, it's very hard to give you a, an interpretation unless you at least have the basis, you know, a base knowledge of what the text is, some notion of what the text is all about. So what I would first encourage you to do is to get the young people to read the Gathas. And there's no reason why you couldn't have a young group, dis, a young, younger person's discussion group about this. It seems to me it springs, it encourages interest in it, development talk, can invite people, there are many people here in London uh, who have uh, uh, an educated knowledge about the history of Zoroastrianism and they would happily participate in such groups. But there has to be some discussion. Right? Without any kind of discussion, it seems to me there cannot be any interest evoked right, or provoked among the younger people. So this is what I would do. Actually, it's a follow-up question or statement, uh, Professor Inza. Um, me, for myself, for my part, I'm, I'm reading the Gathas in 10 years. In the beginning, I didn't understand a thing. I was just reading what it's trying to say, so how can I be good? It's really not easy. It takes a lot of time. And I think it's very difficult for young people to, at all to, just, to get started with it. And I think it, it just needs a bit more help from the communities that here. It means um, we need to encourage the young people. For example, just we can learn a lot from the Christians, how, how the church is done. Young, young people singing, taking guitar, just taking, getting together, um, having a place to go, these sort of things. And um, just be open, open-minded. And, and because today, you, you can't like, get um, young people drawn to your faith if, if you are close-minded, you know. Conservative, so it, it needs to, to go on. As the Zoroastrian religion is progressive, right? So it, so it has just to move on. I think, unfortunately, I don't see much. And since years, I'm trying myself or in our group to do something, getting something out, but nothing's really happening, and uh, you're dying out. But you have a Zoroastrian uh, center now in London. And it seems to me that you who are involved with the Zoroastrian center. It's splitted. It's what? Splinter. I don't want to go into the details. Yeah, okay. <coughs> <coughs> the unity isn't there, uh, but I don't know. Have to the point. Yeah. Next question. Anybody else would like to ask a question just in front of you? Just come in. Mike is just coming. The lady, the you know, mic. Late Professor Mary Boyce has a great influence on Western thinking scholars. How much influence has she got on you too? On me? You as well as the other Eastern, Eastern scholars more. Yeah, kind of hard question. And I will talk about the Japanese uh, problem. Yes. Professor Mary Boyd's famous book, The Zoroastrians, published in 1979, was translated into Japanese in 1983. And this book found good sales. And many Japanese average students read this Japanese translation of Mary Boyd's Zoroastrian. So, Japanese uh, university student was much influenced from Mary Boyd's book. Thank you. Okay. Of course, of course, I re I read a book by uh, Mary Boyd when I oh when I had uh, my uh, one of my tutors who. Uh, who are working together? Uh, we are working together to write a book in Chinese, uh, the history of uh, Zoroastrian Chinese. We read the Mary Boyce, and we bought we bought the Mary Boyce, almost all the uh, published books. Uh, uh, it's very difficult. It's very. It's not very easy for us to get uh, to purchase the whole uh, the whole the volumes of. Uh, uh, 
of the books in 19, in the first year of 1990s, it usually cost, cost a lot, cost a very high price for us to buy it because we, there is only one, uh, uh, the, 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 comp the book company uh, to do the international uh, trade of books, so it's very expensive for us. Even, even it is very uh, expensive, we bought that and we, uh, we collect uh, all, all, almost all the books written by Mary Pop boys. Mary Boyce was an extraordinary scholar. Her history of Zoroastrianism in several volumes uh, is the very accurate uh, history of the various uh, periods of the development of the religion, right, the political, social situation at all. My trouble with Mary is that she was not much of an interpreter that went beyond the word. In a certain sense, she was extremely literal in all of this, right? So if you ask me what her influence on me was, well, it's great reverence, right, for the scholarship embedded, right, in all of her careful sifting of the materials, their organization and everything. What is my influence on Mary Boyce when she translates passages from the Gathas, she uses my translation, right, which of course uh, I'm very much indebted to. Right? She could have picked a lot of other junk, right? But <laughs> she favored my junk before the others, right? And uh, I'm very happy about that. But she was an extraordinary person, right? And to a large degree, I think a lot of the renewed interest, right, in the history of Zoroastrianism particularly in Europe and America, is due to her extraordinary efforts, and we all admired her for that. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Um, okay, there's a question in the back there. No, not a question. Oh. If I may add about Mary Boy, not only did she did quite a lot in her lifetime, but even after she passed away, she passed all of her uh, uh, <coughs> bequests for the study of Zoroastrianism at the School of Oriental and African Studies. Yeah. Always deserves to community. All of us are highly indebted. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Any other questions? Uh, one question at the front here, please, please. Uh, this question is for Charlotte. Could, could you just wait for the mic? Because people at the back may not hear you. And I think we will have to make this the penultimate question. There's one more question someone wants to ask after this. Uh, a number of years ago, I was visiting uh, Esfahan with a number of priests from uh, Bombay. And they took us to a mosque in uh, main near the marketplace. It was called masjid e or masjid e -e. And then these priests were wearing these white clothes and everything, and they, they asked me who they were. I said they were Zoroastrians. They have never seen Zoroastrians, and they thought they didn't exist. But they were quite surprised to see them in, in flesh. So the keeper took us downstairs into the basement and showed us where these pillars were. And I happened to have a photograph of that place downstairs. A few years later on, I went there and I wanted to go there. They said, no, such place does not exist at all, and they would not let me go to see it. I'm wondering if you yes. have any first-hand uh, experience of that. Uh, the exhibition done by Italian archaeologists uh, in 1970s. However, when the Islamic regime came to power, I think two or, two or three years after they came to power, they filled their space completely. So there is no empty space that you cannot go and visit anything. Although they don't deny there, it was used to be a fire temple under the Nizam of Mork Dome, but you can't see it anymore now. Right, one final question. There is one. Can you make it short? And then we'll just wrap up. Can I ask you, it might be a personal question the two gentlemen here. What was it that got them interested in Zoroastrian studies or religion or studying it or whatever? In the first instance, what got them interested? Mm. In my, yes. that's a fine question. Yes, in my case, I started my career as an Islamic study student in Tokyo University. But uh, continuing to study about Islamic mysticism in the 16th and 17th century, I met the Zoroastrian or pseudo Zoroastrian mystic named Azar Kaiwan from Shiraz, and he died at Patna in Hindustan in 
Um, I want to thank our guest, uh, Celine um, Lee, uh, for coming along at short notice to translate in case we needed a translation, as, as we did of the poem. So thank you very much. Godfrey Irani. Please come forward and <coughs> just a little joking. Thank you very much. Today, without inviting Kushi Kapadia, our very devoted secretary, who is the lifeblood of the organization because she gets people like you to join and help us to grow the organization. Please, Kushi, come and do us the honor. years because of his daughter, granddaughter's third birthday, which he dared not miss. So we want to think of him and thank him for all the good work that he has been doing for the last few years. And thank you very much, all of you, for coming year in and year out. And please do bring some more people next time. I think we've nearly reached the number 100, and we hope to go over it next time. So thank you very much, and thank you. Thank you.